Thank you, Peter, and um, all the uh, generosity that um, CUHK has showed me. Um, I have taken my title from Eduardo Cohn's How a Forest Thinks. Eduardo Cohn is among the group of anthropologists collectively known as part of the ontological term, with which I'm broadly uh, sympathetic. Basically, the idea is that the, what is important doesn't just come from the interpretation of the ethnographer, but the ethnographer acknowledges the depth of the concrete world in which he or she finds herself. At the same time, they tend to keep it as a consistent discourse. If you were to do this quickly, Cohen's fifth chapter is probably a good place to start. But it includes people like Latour, uh, Strathern, uh, Descola, and primarily Viveros de Castros, but also people like Salins, who were much earlier. So it's actually been around for quite a while. I'm starting with um, a fairly banal uh, comparison that happens to be made by a non-banal person. The idea that the city and language have something to do with each other. Uh, what interests me is he sees it as an ancient city. That is to say, you're always already played by your city, um, or any city you go to. And if for Heidegger, the metaphor of the clearing is the there in which being attains understanding. And this is comparable to civic ritual. Is that coming up there? No. How can I point? Or is that a pointer? <coughs> Does that work? Um, right, good. Um, that is to say, uh, this is something um, that comes out of gears. Um, civic um, um, ritual, civic ceremony, uh, tragic drama, philosophy all have that characteristic of time out of time in which the original conditions and one present possibilities are brought into visibility. So at any rate, if for Heidegger the clearing is the site in which understanding happens, it is the forest and its undergrowth which, pro which provides the conditions for clearing. That's to say, for what I'll talk about subsequently, the conditions for metaphor. Taking two things as its point of departure, the insight of Leonardo Bruni that the poet and the businessman have a comparable metaphoric talent, but also the phenomenon, the problem of ethics. All right, I'm summarizing the whole of urban development in one image um, up to the end of the 18th century. This is Bolotto's view of Barcelona where the city is almost an increment of the natural conditions, um, moving from the, the muck of the river up through the mountain to the oculus in the sky, mediated by the royal, you know, the princes and priests. And the quote, which you won't have time to read, is from Philo of Alexandria, um, about 400 years before Augustine, but indicating how ancient this idea of city as metaphor of world and its connection to a species of creator god. He's here echoing um, Yahweh's response to Job from the whirlwind. Um, as what is at stake in the pivotal meaning of the city? And of course, it's with the metropolis that this begins to decay. And I'm going to, because a lot of what got brought up at the time of the metropolis is still relevant, I'm going to call out two versions of Metropolis. The first, which is um, coincident with Wittgenstein, is the motif of Vienna versus New York City, um, which I take from David Frisbee's uh, Cityscapes of Modernity. The advent of mass culture, and particularly by giving the franchise to the, as it were, lower classes, the contest between the civilization preserved by the upper classes and the revolutions, notably of 48 and 64, uh, 1848 and 64. Um, 
the decay of civic humanism into a kind of didactic pompous aesthetics that could be inscribed on all buildings with a pediment. The advent of industry, things like the railroad, capitalism, and the beginning of thinking of city in terms of systems and fields, and therefore the misreading of somebody like Hippo Davis, but not going to get into that. And the advent of the knowledge economy, as we now call it, as the way in which you begin to bring your city uh, to understanding and begin to operate on it. At the time, it ranged between the scientist, the detective, and the artist. In particular, it's a period when urban sociology and anthropology begin, with people like Georg Zimmel and the École des Hautes Etudes Urbaines in Paris. And for people like Zimmel, Benjamin, and Krakow, there's two key themes that are still talked about. One is the fear that their cultural integrity and morality inherited from the tradition will be lost in the systems of circulation, since called flows, of capital, commodities, information, and people, and that in fact civic life will tend towards a commodification of the individual and in abstract system, something like the spectator culture of the goal. And the what I call representational cunning that goes along with that. The idea that you treat everything with a certain amount of skepticism. Secondly, the reification of the individual, now typically called the subject of the agent. And whether he or she is involved with a crowd or a public, as the Chicago School, the Parsons public. And <clears throat> this phenomenon of social distance, i.e. we keep our distance from each other, but spatial proximity, we find ourselves standing next to each other on the two. And it's this spectrum between civility and danger that produces the conception of both architecture and people in terms of types. Um, again, which I'm not going to go into. Sorry, I've chopped out a lot. I hope this makes some sense. Um, and it's by 1913, at least, that somebody like the Kiriko is mocking this didactic moral vision of the city and the perspectivism on which it depends. Um, and, and endowing it with this you know, hollow nostalgia. Now these metropolis, metropolises were um, socially very differentiated. On the right is one of the rooms of Jacques Doucet's residence in Paris. It was one of three rooms for anyone who doesn't know Jacques Doucet. Um, he was one of the major collectors of surrealism, um, cubism, but in an extra, he was the first guy to own Demisel d'Avignon. And this was the third of three big room, three major rooms in his flat, um, with his African and Polynesian pots and masks, paintings from China and Japan, a table by Eileen Gray, a palmette table, and the walls and ceiling covered in pigskin. And to get into this room, you pass through an infinite mirror of the inside faces of this. Meanwhile, Ilya Ehrenberg, uh, in Paris at the same time, or roughly the same time, a good communist, is looking at the working class area of Paris. And he, in, in his little book, he picks on Belleville, beautiful town, which has these aromatic names for its streets that actually smell of soot and sewage and populated by people in pain. And it's at the same time those people, I mean, there's a kind of patronism to his communism there that, I'm, I'm, again, I'm not going to get into, that are basis of my second version of the metropolis. And for these people, the metropolis is only superficially a random aggregator system, systematic circulation of abstract fragments. Rather, the primordial conditions are always in place. The typicality of situations, such as face-to-face -face discourse, sleeping, waking, the typicality of settings, i.e. architecture of the horizon and praxis, all of these are, this is Joyce's Dublin, um, <clears throat> are rooms where things happen characteristically. And the persistence of fundamental conditions, the metamorphic earth, the light dark sky, celestial and seasonal cycles and tides. And similarly, it's a different kind of knowledge. The orientation is to the concrete case rather than conceptual generalization. It's a phenomenon of understanding, ever evolving, rather than knowledge, and attempting to dominate the context through concepts. We are always learning our cities, 
And this is the title of a book by Carlton Farley, which you probably know, whose first chapter is sociological jargon, but whose subsequent chapters, all case studies, are a very good cross-section of ways in which the city is learned from um, you know, building toilets in um, rural India through to research, to policy making, even every day. And for these people, the continuity is metaphoric, indirect, and logic, not logical or systematic. Or rather, for these people, the concrete and the logic and systematic has itself a metaphoric value, as you see in somebody like Joyce particularly. At any rate, the more primitive gives orientation to or situates the logical and systematic. For these people, language isn't complex the way the kind of semiotic code might suggest, but rich or deep. This is the already spoken by a vintage theme. And in particular, I call attention to Joyce's Ulysses, which avoids all the you know, prominent institutions and takes place in the deep background. And it's the deep background socially as well. It's the people who don't get it, who are marginalized, or only partially get it, in whom the European city is embodied. At any rate, it's into this, these two kinds of metropolises that the phenomenon of space appears. And one of my, I, I, I don't think there's any more destructive concept for understanding the city than space. It's a promiscuous generality that is everything and nothing. Everything in general, nothing in particular. One sees it first in something like Mallarmé's um, a throw of the dice doesn't abolish chance, where the white of the page is both the gulf in which the shipwreck takes place, and this is the flotsam and jetsam, but it's also the night sky in which the potentially redemptive constellation appears, affiliated with number and rhythm and so forth. For this great concept of space, one of the first guys to use space, as we now use it, was Adolf Apia, is this weird matter-like that, you know, out of which our models are still made, our drawings are still made. I mean, many people still talk about architects making form. If that's a place to live. Um, and for, but um, where, where this is tinted with depth, for somebody like Wazitsky, the white is sort of, you know, a box section through an indefinite, optimistic, you know, new world. And you get these strange diagrams, you know, prepped, um, curiously, about 15 years before Heidegger, from, from Paul Clay, where uh, I and thou takes place in the di primary dialectic between Earth and world. This problem of space is an interesting one. Um, I'm not going to go through this. You'll be happy to hear. Um, all I want to point out is that it really <coughs> requires all of these. And it's about this, about the time of the Davos debate between Heidegger and Kassirer that it be, the penny begins to drop that there is something like space is a key issue in terms of particularly the Enlightenment inheritance and how you understand morality, how you understand things. And it really does require that full spectrum. And space seems to have been concocted as a kind of concept that could cope with all of that and yet demand that you understand it in terms of experience. And of course, the effect on the city was is well known, where 500 years of attempting to make the city into the tragic set, obviously from the Trubius originates, these are Celio's versions. Um, the, the place of beauty, of the nobles, of uh, highest land values, of culture, meant that <coughs> the artisan city got treated as it was by the Corbusier for the Pavillon de Ton Nouveau, he called it um, a swamp. Uh, sorry, he called it a slum. The Memare means swamp. <laughs> um, and so for him, you know, there's this path of redemption that re results in this Carstiesian city of light and crystalline towers and so forth. And the, uh, whoops, it's the inevitable topographies that you are, with which you're all familiar, these are from Milan. So a kind of um, agonic sequences 
topography from mainly from the 16th and 17th to the 19th century whoops, fields that are out here, I'm getting a reflection, uh, to the 20th century fields, particularly as it relates to what I call housing with a Z, um, the statistical distribution of privacies um, that tend to be anti-urban. Into that was dropped this familiar figure. This is, it begins in the 50s in America and is gradually exported globally, where you start, a developer starts putting together, you know, um, this is Tyson's Corners. Dulles Airport is out here, Washington DC is here. It started here. This is its double, more recently completed. And then, but it's, it's clear, so I, I used it. Um, you know, it's a mall with <coughs> hotels and meeting places, i.e. a kind of transaction center set in a sea of suburban life. <coughs> and to get a sense of the scale, this is the Guy's Hospital Block from London. That's Borough High Street. The uh, Shard is right over here. But that urban block, which is a familiar kind of metropolitan block, where you know the lawyers will be out in here, and there'll be all sorts of lesser activities that are constantly changing and semi-legal activities. Oh, thanks very much. Um, but the depth can also take something like a major hospital. That's about 220 meters long. These are both to the same scale. <coughs> and of course, what's happened is that these kind of things have now begun to appear, uh, begun to appear in our cities. This is the conflict between uh, the edge of Spitalfields and Newburgh Folgate, where the gap that they had to leave over the train line um, becomes, you know, what they call public space with a cost of coffee in it. Um, and of course, you then end up with a familiar dilemma of capitalism, where something like Sheepside Road and these new developments are all kind of huge versions of Tyson's Corners. And <coughs> <coughs> characterized as by most people as neoliberalism for which public space is supposedly the antidote. But what interests me is the way it's seen as an evil under these conditions and under these conditions in Dharavi, it's seen as the only way these subjective peoples can capture the eddies in capitalism through empowerment, through what he calls capacity. Um, necessarily meaning they have to sacrifice their tradition. And while I'm all for sustainability, these kinds of analyses of the city are, I mean, if you're really going to take it seriously, it looks like this. And I'm sorry, 72 DPI just doesn't cope with it. But that's a diagram published by the Roche uh, company of cell metabolism. And just to give you a sense of the detail, I've blown up the energy cycles in the middle, which are the most ancient parts of the, the living cell. And this means being able to bring all of life to that single horizon of representation. And ultimately, this is the dream of kind of the information city. Um, you see relics of this even within the so-called ontological term. This is Latour's famous actor network theory. And I'm not going to go through a long debate with, and that's for another time. But just to give an idea, what he says, the way you understand the background of the phenomena is that you trace an activity, in this case, Alice voting. And this is from an early book that he published in the, in the early 90s, um, showing Alice voting. And she then finds herself in the media scrum outside um, the voting booth, and then finds herself you know, dealing with the media itself to understand the significance of her vote. And what he says, he says it's yes, it's a very positive exercise. It's all about direct mediators. You don't assume the social, rather the social is built up from the network of these mediations. And in a recent conference in London, he referred to the white space here uh, as like the gaps in a, in a metro diagram, as just plasma. By contrast, if you look at the detective, this uh, Franco Moretti's description of Sherlock Holmes Sherlock Holmes has a period because he's you know, got enough money, he's not doing it for pay, he's a kind of student of human nature, a very ethnographer, if you like, and you know, all his disguises, he can go from the lowest to the highest levels of London society. 
Um, but the corollary of this is a cultural universe is the most effective means of policing. That is to say, this is a, <clears throat> I, I, I would claim that this loses the city, or you, it's an infinite task, not unlike that, where you end up with a, you know, bringing everything to these networks and you lose precisely what's important, the depth. And so I, um, I, I don't have time to go through this in great detail, and I would say two things to this. One, that all of our ontological involvements are like the Nagon. There is always an element of distance. And with that, a claim made by the other person, the other object, the forest, whatever. Um, and therefore, I dispose of perception of as a way of understanding human experience. It's, it's I, I use involvement with. It comes out of Heidegger's transformation of Rousseau. But as, as long as we have that basic shift, that's all we need for today. And I would compare what goes on in, for example, the Greek Halaya, here the famous image of um, Achilles and Ajax supposedly playing more of a game. And here, in something that I'm going to turn vertically in a moment, um, I have not, but if anybody ever knows this painting better than I do, which would be anybody who knows something about it, I've been, I've been unable to, Stan tells me this morning, one of these seals tells him it's in, it's in the palace collection in Beijing, and I just went through what they have online, and it isn't there. I'm guessing it's late zone, early Yuan, perhaps to do with the literati, but I really don't know. But what interests me is that there's one figure looking at nature, Four figures playing what in Japan is called Go, and one figure reading. So there's this movement between nature, involvement in nature, the agon, and reflection. That is an essential insight as far as I'm concerned, because I would see all, as I say, all relations have this agonic character, but they all happen in levels. So the, fund, the, the lower, the least articulate levels ground the more sophisticated levels of understanding. Um, what's of course happened since, and has been a subject of complaint ever since, um, you know, the late 18th century people like Jacobi and you know, the romantics, is that we've privileged our conceptual powers. And these have become just assumed or they become sort of weird topics like the body in the, in the 80s. And what, one of the lessons I would take out of this, again, just for a half hour this morning, is that I would, you know, all architectural thought is multidisciplinary, according to the disciplines in the university. And it's the topic that gives you orientation, not the method. If you just, if, I mean, this, is, this comes out of teaching PhDs by practice that your design imagination is as important as your analytic imagination. The scene that Peter talked about where you end up with one wall that's all data and another wall that's all poetics at the beginning of the year, you know, performances, interventions, and you're supposed to make a response to that. It's this kind of problem that, you know, how to capture what's important to a city that this issue, uh, in my view, illuminates. <coughs> So if I'm going to um, um, compare and contrast, let's say, the street from Kobukonum with the street from Whitechapel in, Lom in London, there's obviously similarities and differences. And again, I don't have time to do this in detail. But if I just take one issue at the bottom of the pile, the phenomenon of matter, or as we like to say, materiality, because we don't have materials, in part, you probably can't read them. But in part, it's because you end up with these silly terms for things like tiles or you know, texture mapping onto form you know, digitally. Um, but it's part of a long story that, you know, of which Bergson in the late 19th century was attempting to rejoin the body and spirit centered by Descartes. But it, it's the background to things like Latour and you probably know Jane Bennett's vibrant matter. She's another one part of this so-called ontological term. But if you look at somebody like Bruno Schultz from 1934, you'll see that you know, shells have personalities. His whole world is, is, is much more informed 
by the potential and the richness of this, the basic conclusion is there's no such thing as matter as such, just as there's no such thing as space as such, or time as such. It's always something, always involved, always somewhere across all the scales. And so we're in a world where the differences are understood in terms of their analogical continuity. So this is a little thing on table from you know, basic eating to writing to a laboratory to sacrifice to you know, potential city for a cake plane and puns on the water table or this horizon line from um, Saul Steinberg. <clears throat> Similarly, the, um, these pieces from uh, Ernst, I'm using this one illuminated by these, where science attempts to triangulate theology walking on the water and it's, you know, his notion of horizon can be seen in some of the later frottages where human habitation takes place across that boundary, or his water might be illuminated by the Loire Valley. This is more directly relevant. This is an early piece in which the land animals gaze forlornly at the sea animals by way of some furniture in a room that was created by simply painting over all the illustrations that were in a uh, dictionary with their proper names underneath them. And this floor and that water, that room of understanding, begin to illuminate how metaphor operates, where various versions of life begin to seem like one biological entity. It's on the basis of this kind of metaphoric thinking that you get a continuity from the Deschamps shrine through to Bonchamp. Or these more open metaphoric pieces the famous reworking of the suburban house in Hanover by Kurt Schwitters, or this by Eva Hesse, where earth on the ground becomes brick in the walls as the kind of flesh, synthetic flesh, moves from recumbent to erect, possibly a window, possibly flay. It's a much more open kind of metaphor. <clears throat> but it also, metaphor is also the basis on which Something like cabaret grows out of much older traditions of restaurant, cafe, bar, and theater. And the political content can become agitprop and immigrate back into the city, participating in the, you know, terre de Marseille of the Bakhtin talks about. Um, this is this phenomenon in reverse, where Joyce uses these background experiences, and you begin to get a sense of the, of the power and richness of this kind of analogical universe. This is a little fragment from The Wake. Past times are past times. That, that's the time out of time that we talked about at the beginning. Now let bygones be by German Gunns, which is both the pub and Alexander Gunn, who wrote a thing called The Problem of Time. Since primal made altar, since God made Adam, since first made second and an altar in the garden of Edem, the tasks above are so flask below, that which is above is as that below, sets the emerald canticle, the emerald tablet of Hermes Truth with Justice, and all's um, love and pleasure, hatred and please stir, solar systematized, so that's this world, solar systematized, serial, cosmically serious, and comically, and it's a, it was a hypothesis about the universe, which I'm not going to get into, and more and more almighty expanding universe under one. There is rhymeless, i.e. scientific rather than poetic reason to believe, original son, sin, son of God, Adam the son, so on and so forth. To this there is this footnote. So those are all modes of transformation of world. To that is a footnote that is journeys. We don't hear the booming cursoires, i.e. warriors cursing, but also the bird. We won't fear the fletches of fighting the flashes of lightning and the arrows of fighting. We float the Mediterranean, which is a common sea, and come back to the isle we love in spice point. <clears throat> what that refers to, and the Egyptian iconography goes all through the wake, is Hatshepsut's journey, famous journey to Nubia. This is a copy of a relief in her tomb. And what she got in Nubia were the spices that you use for embalming. Now, it's also an Irish pun, where the spice islands are the outhouse. And punt is the sound of a turd hitting the ground, and a point in space, or 
point in space. <coughs> From those, I've got about two minutes. Um, this is a little piece from Witherford Watson Mann Architects in London that they call Urban Forest. This is Southwark. Um, <clears throat> that's the Blackfriars Bridge, that's Southwark Bridge, that's Tate Modern. The block, I, this is Borough High Street, the block I showed you earlier is here. That's the Shard. And they, it was so called, you know, everybody talks about public grounds, mostly outdoors. But they began to see, they tried to come up with a drawing. Why am I, I seem to have run out of battery here. Right. Uh, they came up with a drawing that will allow you to move from a public life into, i.e. public doesn't just take place outdoors. And they developed these settings, and this is one of them as, you know, using found party walls to make a uh, milieu that corresponds to that drawing below. And I think well, the, the one bit I would like to point out there is this phrase in being in time that he never develops, that the city gives a direction to nature. I, this, the, 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 the fundamental, I, I, I see a city as the ethical interpretation of the natural conditions. Um, we don't have time to go through the upper bit, but I would simply call attention to the Aristotle in the middle, that nature gives us the capacity to receive the virtues and this city is brought to maturity by habit. That is to say, you learn it by doing it. You don't. You can't turn it into a knowledge or a recipe. The, the Gadamer's essays on praxis, or practice, talk about the same sort of thing. <clears throat> that is to say, it's it's built out of the institutions of which the city is made. It's got a topographic depth and an ontological depth. That of which the latter is an opportunity, as you know, it's, it, it deals with your imagination, your commitment. But this again, why I think your design imagination is much more important to entering into dialogue with the city than attempting to turn it into some sort of con for, um, concept by which you derive the city. You just you simply can't cope with its richness. Um, that it's ultimately a question of basic integrity. Um, that tact, which is one of the aspects of making, i.e. a material situation, um, puts a claim on you with respect to, you know, you can do certain things with plastic, you can't do with wood, and vice versa. But that both wit and tragedy appeal to what is common to all, and that something like city making is our highest calling. Okay, let's stop there. Thanks very much. <coughs>